Hey guys, what's going on? Welcome to the KJ52 Podcast. Uh, a couple things just to let you know right off the top. If you ever want to support the podcast, you can head over to patreon.com forward slash KJ52 and become a patron. It starts as low as $1, goes all the way up to $52. You can get uh, song feedback and a whole bunch of exclusive stuff. Also, my pre-sale for my new book uh, is going on right now. You can head over to kj52book.com and check that out. If you purchase the audiobook, which is now available exclusively right there, uh, you actually get my new project free as a download, and it's literally 10 bucks. So, dumb cheap, no reason why not to get it. I'm finishing up the physical side, the design of it and things like that. The book's actually done, uh, but I'm just finishing that up and uh, looking forward to dropping that on you guys. The book and the new album is both called What Happened Was. Um, the book is a collection of stories uh, from my life, 23 chapters, 23 different kind of stories, all with a, I don't know, some sort of positive resolution to it. I don't know. It's hard to explain. I, I think the best thing you can do is just go check it out, uh, kj52book.com. I think you'll be pleasantly pleased. Anyway, I wanted to go ahead and dive into this topic uh, for this podcast. Um, this is something I threw out on my social media, but it's also based on a teaching that I did for our youth ministry. Uh, they have a kind of an intensive small group uh, at our youth ministry called Summit, where they tackle a lot of the heavier topics or the more controversial topics, and they bring in someone to talk about it, in this case, myself. Um, and to share their perspective and to look at it. And so in this particular case, the topic was Mary Joanna, the marijuana, you know, the wacky weed, the jazz cabbage, if you will. Uh, no, it was weed, basically. So um, so, it was, so getting kind of into you know, my preparation for the, for the topic, I said, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and put this on my uh, Instagram um my Instagram story just to get a poll going. And I know I have people from all different perspectives that are fans, um, some that are complete atheists to hardcore Bible believing, Bible thumping, God bless you top Christians. Um and everything in between. And so I said, you know what, I'm just gonna do an informal poll. Is smoking weed a sin? And the final results, and granted, this is just on my Instagram, it's kind of a small sample, um, it was about 65% said yes, and 35% said no, and so I said, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and take this one step further, and I'm going to put this up on all my social media, just to see what people say, and here we are days later, and they're still arguing about it, so that just shows me that I struck a nerve here. And so I am going to just essentially, uh, this was going to be a discussion with somebody else, but I felt like it was too timely to not um, dive into, so I figured I'd just go ahead and, and just do it solo dolo. But you can hear some of the stuff that I talked about in my summit class, and uh, feel free to uh, you know comment where you see this posted, or you can always send me an email at kj52, kj52 at kj52.com. So anyway, uh, I was sitting with about, I think, five teenagers, mixed group, and I started by basically saying, I gave them three questions. The three questions were, one, you know, does the Bible talk about weed? Two, is it a sin to get high? And three, what does the term, all things are permittable, but not all things are beneficial mean? So we gave them about 30 minutes to kind of look that up, and, you know, in, in scripture, essentially, and I came in about 30 minutes later, and I just said, "Hey, what was your uh, what was your perspective on this?" And you know, I already had my sort of answers per se, but I was curious to see what they would say. And so that first question being saying, you know, does the Bible talk about weed? Um, one thing they brought up was that uh, it's kind of widely regarded that an element that is in hemp, or I think it's in marijuana in itself was used in the temple oil so while the Bible does not speak about smoking weed um, like a lot of you know ancient civilizations 
they've been using this plant in some way, shape, or fashion. I would be the firm, you know, and I've heard people, like, I've had weed heads. Now, I just want to say, first of all, for clarity, when I say weed heads, I don't mean this necessarily derogatory. This is no different than what I would say hip-hop heads or sneaker heads or whatever. It just means someone that's, like, into that thing, right? So when I, I'm going to use weed heads probably through this whole podcast. If that offends you, I don't know what to tell you. I'm sorry. Um, but anyway, I know a lot of weed heads that go, oh, well, you know, the weed, weed's in the Bible, man, because, you know, they used it in the temple. So obviously they were smoking it. I'm like, guys, let's not like read something into that's not there. Uh, and one thing we kind of came to the conclusion was that, no, it's not mentioned because the idea of smoking cannabis was just not a thing in scripture. So one thing I kind of challenged him, I said, well, when you hit an area that you're looking for answers in scripture or the Bible and you don't have a direct answer, then usually the the next best thing is to look at the principle behind it. Meaning, okay, we can't find this cited. And, and, you know, I know people that go, oh, well, it's not in there. So then it's free for all. But I'm like, why not take one step further back and go, well, what's the principle behind it? Right. And so I'm going to look at that, but I'm also going to look at like, you know, we're going to just start with the weed smoke, smoking acid. So one of them said, well, you know, the Bible does say to be sober minded and to be vigilant. And that's in first Peter five, eight. And that was actually the verse that I kind of wanted them to find. Meaning in my humble opinion, it is hard to be sober minded if you're high as the, as you know, as scripture kind of teaches. So also the Bible says to not give yourself into drunkenness. And sometimes I hear people say, well, you could do weed in moderation, just like you can do alcohol in moderation. And again, correct me if I'm wrong. I do know that obviously you can take a drink, have a glass of wine, and you're not going to be drunk. As far as I know, you take, smoke a joint, you smoke on that jazz cabbage, you're going to be high immediately. So I've heard people say that there is the possibility of recreational weed. I kind of feel like that's sort of, I think you'd have to be smoking for a long time to not get high while you're smoking the jazz cabbage. I could be wrong here, but uh, based on my experience, and let me say, first of all, when I say my experience, I've never smoked weed in my life. As a teenager, did I try to get some? Absolutely. So I know immediately I got a lot of weed heads that are going to go, oh, how are you going to sit here and talk about weed when you've never smoked weed? First of all, can we just say I've never been bitten by a shark before? I don't plan to be bitten by a shark. I don't want to be bitten by a shark. But I can tell you, without being bitten by a shark, that I'm probably not going to want to get bit by a shark. Okay, so the whole, you don't know anything because you've never done it before, invalidates your argument. Let's just kind of put that to the side. Okay, guys? Anyway. And that's kind of where we landed right off the gate. You know, 1 Peter 5, 8. Uh, be sober-minded. Be vigilant. Your, your enemy goes around like a roaring lion trying to seek who can make and devour. But then I said, well, is it wrong to get high? Meaning... When I say high, I mean a euphoric state. Meaning, can you be feeling euphorically happy to a level that feels equivalent to a high? And after we kind of talked about this for a while, we, we kind of said, well, there can be natural highs that do not involve any other outside things. In other words, I know runners that can hit a runner's high. Um, and then we even kind of shared our experiences of like, moments in our lives where we felt so elated and such a happy point that it was like being high, meaning we felt like we were outside of our body. We felt like we were in a, uh, a euphoric state of consciousness, so to speak. And there's nothing wrong with those things, right? And then we kind of came to the third question, which I said, which was, you know, all things are permissible, but not all things are beneficial. Meaning, This is something that Paul wrote to the Corinthian church. And so when Paul was writing to the Corinthian church, we have to understand that, you know, the Corinthian church was was like the Las Vegas, the the, the area that they were in was like Corinth, the Las Vegas of our, you know, 
what goes to, you know, what happens in Las Vegas stays in Las Vegas. The Corinth church that Paul was writing to was very liberal, very anything goes, feels good, do it. They were kind of a church of no self-control whatsoever. Go for it. Do it. And you notice when Paul writes to different churches or has different letters in the Bible, he's dealing with different types of believers. The Corinth church was a very liberal, go for it, whatever it feels like type of church where he also sometimes wrote to the other side where the churches were super legalistic and they were all about rules and regulations. And what Paul, you kind of notice that he always kind of stresses is that somewhere in the middle is the right place to be at. I mean, we're not called to everything goes and we're also not called to, you know, super binding uh, levels of, you know, pharisaical interpretation of scripture. Anyway, but Paul says one thing, he goes, and all things are permissible and not all things are beneficial. And he kind of says this to the Corinth church. He's like, look, your slogan is we can do whatever we want. And Paul's like, you know what? You're absolutely right. You can do, because I believe firmly in free will, you can do whatever you want to do. And Paul's kind of saying, but not all things will actually benefit you. And we kind of discussed those three questions. I kind of shared a little bit about, you know, as an adolescent, uh, messing around with alcohol, drinking, you know, 180 proof whiskey when I was like 12, you know, and just getting wasted a few times. And I was really on a progression that the alcohol was kind of like my, my way in as a, as a young teen. And then I'm like, you know what, the next party I go to, I'm stepping up my game. I am going to be the first one to bring a nickel bag or dime bag of weed. And I was really on that path. I was trying to get hooked up with a guy that rode my bus. And I was trying to get a bag of weed off him. It never actually happened because I ended up moving. And that summer is when I came to Christ. But the point being is that I was steadily on this progress that it's interesting to find out. Because when I went back to my old homies from that old high school that I had moved from, I said, well, you know, what was like, you know, what was high school like after I left for the next three years? And like one of my friends was like, dude, I went to school high every day. So, again, I just think that I was definitely progressing on that path. That would have probably been my next, you know, drug of choice to kind of fit in, to numb the pain, to feel good, whatever. So from there, I was starting talking to teenagers. I said, well, you know what, let me, let me at least share my story a little bit. And so I shared with them how I kind of grew up in the, in the 80s, which was the just say no era. Just say no to drugs era, Right. But I also lived in South Florida, which for all intents and purposes in the 80s was, you know, the gateway for cocaine to come into the entire United States. And my dad had told me about one time how there used to be these things that would wash up on the beaches in Miami called square groupers. And what the square grouper was, was basically an entire square of of marijuana that they would dump out the plane and it would end up washing up. And, you know, and I had heard stories about, you know, a town that's like 45 minutes away from me uh, called Everglades City, where the entire city was like on the take, this tiny little fishing town. Now, half the city got arrested in the 80s for basically being, you know, a, a pathway for drugs to come into Florida. And so, like, you know, Florida's kind of one of those wacky states where, in a lot of ways, anything can kind of go, right? So... While I never smoked weed in my life, let me just tell you, without saying anything specifically, I definitely knew what it smelled like. I knew what it smelled like from being around it. I knew what it looked like from being around it. I knew what it entailed. I knew what it did to people. But also at the same time, I was being fed this like Nancy Reagan, just say no vibe, which in a lot of ways, when it came to weed, was kind of misinformation, meaning they made it seem to us that weed was on the addictive level of cocaine and that if you smoked it one time, you'd be addicted for life and that your next step was that you'd be a, a stoner and that then you'd be face down in the, in the gutter with crack cocaine. <laughs> and I'll never forget this scene from The Breakfast Club that I, was like my favorite movie. And even though I was 10, I didn't really know what was going on. It's like the scene where they go in the back of the room and they all smoke. And I remember watching it in like the four different people in the breakfast club movie and how they react to the weed and i'm thinking 
no way, you can't do that, man, just say no, you know, like, this kind of misinformation that I was told about drugs, right, and so then, you know, the drug PSAs that'd be on all the time, or just, you know, this is your brain on drugs, and they show the, the egg frying, and I'm thinking, man, if I smoke one joint, my brain is going to burst into flames, right, but then I'm getting into hip hop, so once I'm getting into hip hop, it's like every rapper was kind of like anti-drugs in a lot of ways, you know what I mean, NWA for all their craziness, you know, Dre said, um, you know, Dre had an anti-drug line in one of his songs, a lot of the rap, it's, I think we forget about this, a lot of the rap before the early 90s was, was like anti-drugs, it wasn't until Cypress Hill kind of came in and then all of a sudden anything goes smoke weed like crazy. So while I wanted to experiment, I kind of had this idea that, you know, crack is whack and, you know, uh, I don't smoke weed or cess. Like that's what Dre said in NWA's album. So all these things are kind of like shaping my view of this, right? But then I come to Christ at 15 I become super legalistic in my faith. I become super rigid with my understanding of the gospel. Um, And I'm only 15, so my ability to, like, balance everything out. And I was in kind of a, you know, a pretty intensive church at the time. So, I just, I, I didn't have a balanced view of a lot of things. Meaning, I didn't have all the facts. I was going off of what I was being told. I was regurgitating what I knew etc, etc. Now, if you're sitting here going, wait a minute, is KJ just about to make a, a, a full-blown push for smoking weed? Absolutely not. I remember going, you know what, I just want to find out for myself what scripture says. I know scripture is kind of obvious about getting drunk, but what else can I look at? And so I remember reading that verse in Peter, you know, be sober-minded. And I'm thinking in my head, I don't think I can be sober-minded if I smoke weed. It just doesn't seem correct. And then I thought, why though? You know, why am I not supposed to be sober-minded? You know, why should I be sober-minded? Why is that important? And I looked at the verse that's right before it, 1 Peter 5, 7, which I quoted to myself all the time. It said, cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. And then the next one's be sober-minded and alert. And then the next one's like, the enemy, the devil wants to go around like roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And I thought, man, if you run this verse backwards, the enemy wants to devour us. So have a sober mind and cast your cares on him. I started looking at some of the people that I knew that were weed heads or had been former weed heads. And my experience with dudes that had smoked weed like crazy, especially since they were young, they all had terrible short-term memories, right? And I knew, like, my, you know, I have to have a sharp mind to be a rapper. And I knew so many rappers that were like, yo, man, I don't write rhymes till I'm, like, super blazed. And I'm like, dude, you know, I'm not saying that if you smoke weed all the time, you will be a lazy stoner. I know, I'm sure there's people that are uh, productive weed heads. All I can say, though, is the ones that I knew were not. Or the ones that I knew that blazed like crazy since they were really young, all had terrible short-term memories. And I thought, you know what? That's not something I want to do. I I, I have a hard enough time with my short-term memory from two concussions as a kid. I don't need any more problems. (laughs) But anyway, I thought about how many of my friends had anxiety or struggles or hurts or pains. And instead of going to God with it, they went to weed. And the weed made them not sober minded and then eventually you know they were consumed by the enemy or consumed by that drug addiction again I don't want to stereotype and say it was everybody because it's not but I couldn't help but see the progression of that if the verse says cast your cares on, on, on him because he cares for you it's almost like if you're willing to do that first all the other things sort of happen almost like dominoes boom 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 and I look back and go, man, I'm really glad I missed that, right? I'm glad I did not go down that road. I'm glad I didn't get caught up in that because even the most staunch pro-cannabis people I know, all of them will say, you shouldn't be smoking this when you're young. 
because it does cause cognitive problems down the road. And yet I find that a lot of them started when they were super young and now they deal with the consequences of it. Anyway, that was the verse that did it for me. I'm like, you know what? This seems pretty clear. I don't want to be uh, non-sober-minded. I want to be in a state where I am casting my problems. I am going to God with these issues and these problems, right? And so this is that was my policy forever. Like, there's no reason to ever use anything related to weed. I even remember arguing this point in like a speech and debate class. Like I was anti-weed and like anti-drugs. And so I was like really hardcore in my position. And I'll be honest with you guys, there's one thing I'm good and bad at is that arguing my position. Once I get locked in, I'm like a pit bull. And I'm not very good at finding the nuance in things. And maybe as I've grown or I've gotten a little older, I've, I've been trying to do more, listen more, talk less. And so this just kind of brings me to my final point where I'm going to wrap this up. Because a lot of times when you bring up this topic, people go, okay, well, then you shouldn't take Advil or you shouldn't do anything that alters the mind. You shouldn't drink coffee. Uh, You shouldn't have a hamburger. Uh, And they always kind of build what I call a straw man to counteract this idea, right? They say, well, if you say weed is wrong because it affects the body, well, what about eating cheeseburgers? You're the guy who wrote the cheeseburger song. You're the guy who wrote the Mountain Dew song. I'm like, yeah, I did. And those things were not good right? Like I don't drink Mountain Dew anymore. I don't eat Coke fries and cheeseburgers. I learned my lesson by dealing with the ramifications of doing that and gaining weight, being unhealthy. But I understand when people are still with that mindset. So I I try to give grace and some understanding when people are still there. So the big pushback I see from people that are advocates of smoking weed is they'll say, well, you don't know the benefits, the health benefits of how it fights you know, chronic pain or how it helps, you know, people with severe, severe anxiety and things like that. And I used to kind of probably when I would hear that, because this is part of my personality, I'd be like, ah, that's just an excuse. You don't want to go to God. You're taking the easy way out, right? I'm, I'll admit it. I was a jerk at times. Um, and, and here's why I'm saying this. I had a very close friend who, uh, smoked a ton of weed before he was a Christian, got saved, Never went back to it. Pretty anti-weed, right? And he had kind of related to me of how his father, as he watched him get very close to, for, to dying, um, the severe pain that he saw his dad in, right? And he was sharing this with me and he was basically saying, you know, I, I felt like in that moment, if I was able to give him something, you know, CBD or TH, you know, THC related or smoking weed, you know, to ease his pain, he goes, you know what? I probably would have. And I, and he goes, it, it kind of, kind of like changed my perspective on stuff. And, and it's so funny he would say this, right? Because right around that time, I started doing a scripture study in Proverbs 31. And there's this short little section in Proverbs 31 where it talks about the sayings of King Lamuel, and it's L-A-M-U-E-L. And no one actually knows who this king is, but there's about six or seven verses where this just jumps right in there in the middle of Proverbs. And if you don't know what the book of Proverbs is, it's like a short saying of sayings or context or principles that have wisdom to them, right? And there's this verse that I probably read over a bunch of times. It said this. It said, you know, it's not good for kings to chase after women. It's not good for kings to get drunk. And it goes on to say, Give wine and beer to the perishing. Give it to those who are in anguish. Give it to the poor so they can drink and forget their misery. And I remember reading this, even though I'd read it a ton of times, I remember reading this and kind of pausing for a second and going, wait a minute, is this guy advocating the use of wine or people getting drunk essentially like medicine, right? Because he's saying, give it to the perishing. Meaning, if someone's dying, give them wine so they can forget the pain and the anguish of what they're going through as they're dying. Or even, it even says, you know, give it to those that are in anguish. And I thought about that and I thought, well, in that context, wine, while it had been prohibited for drunkenness and had, you know, a very cultural significance to Jewish people, was the closest thing they would have had to an anesthetic or the closest thing they would have had to a drug that they could use to ease that pain. 
And the thing about that is, it's like, wait a minute, that's exactly what they gave to Jesus when he was on the cross about to die. It says they took wine and they mixed it with gall and they put it on a sponge and they handed it to him. Now the Bible says that he refused it, but that's a whole nother topic of why he would have refused it in that moment. The point of what I was thinking was, I'm like, is this, maybe I need to rethink what I'm saying. Is this saying that certain natural things can be used in certain circumstances for the sake of pain management or for the sake of anguish, which could be fall under the line of mental anguish. And I had to kind of go, maybe, you know, maybe there's, there is a place to be said that, that, and I don't mean smoking weed and getting high, but the idea of using medical marijuana, which from what I've heard from people who, who need to use it, that there is a place that it, that it does use for pain management and it doesn't get you high. And, and I kind of had to like relax my stance a little bit and be going, you know what? I might have missed over something in my dogmatic way of going after something that I think there is a place for medical marijuana in certain situations. I do think there's a place to use natural means to combat severe illness or severe pain or severe, even severe mental anxiety in some aspects. I, I do kind of feel that way now. Do I also know that people are going to use this as an excuse to just get high and blaze up? Absolutely. Listen, we all have a degree of coping mechanisms that I think we could all kind of look at and go, is this actually really healthy? You know what I mean? And, and again, going back to that scripture and going, well, it does say to cast our cares on him for he cares for us. The first thing is to go to God with our problems and and then and then to take it from there. So anyway, that's just my two cents. I wanted to share that with you guys. I would love to hear what you think. Uh, appreciate you all. Go check out that book, kj52book.com. And uh, I hope you have an amazing day. I love you all. I appreciate y'all. I appreciate y'all. God bless.